coming up. You know, the hard rock and glam metal bands uh, that ruled MTV and the concert circuit in the 80s, uh, they're well documented from Motley Crue to Def Leppard to Bon Jovi, Whitesnake and on. But one band that was just as big in that moment, but definitely don't get the credit they deserve, we're going to cover them today with an interview with the lead singer. Now, this band's big album sold 5 million copies and it contained a true classic from the era that still rules pop culture today from Cobra Kai to Stranger Things and many more. Coming up next, the singer tells us how the song came about and how he and the guitarist threw live rodents at a model for an album cover shoot during that time, how they got a legendary comedian to dress up like a woman for free to be in their music video. Crazy story about this song is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you were ever uh, the designated channel changer in your home growing up when there was no remote, you're going to enjoy this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Every day we do it, jump in the time machine. Become a full-time part of this by subscribing below. Make sure to click the bell so you always know when our videos and interviews are coming out. Also, check out more content at our Patreon page and get our merch below that helps us keep the music alive. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, this is where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and their greatest albums. You know, today we travel back to the great year of 1984, where a hard rock band called Rat sold 5 million copies of their classic album, Out of the Cellar. Uh, we have an exclusive interview with lead singer and songwriter Stephen Piercy. You know, it seems like history has been somewhat revised when it comes to hard rock and uh, so-called glam metal from the early to late 80s. I mean, everybody knows the stories of Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and White Snake and Motley Crue. But some have forgotten that Rat was just as big, especially in 1984 when Out of the Cellar raced up the charts. It broke boundaries, sold over 5 million copies, like I said. It had the classic number 12 hit, Round and Round. I mean, this band was everywhere that year and beyond. In fact, their first five albums went platinum, one of only a few bands from that era to accomplish that. In fact, Round and Round just went back in the charts due to its use in uh, Geico Out a few years back. Up next, Stephen Piercy gives us the inside scoop about throwing live rats at model Tony Katane and uh, why the band is bigger than ever. This is a really funny interview. So as we get into this, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, the glasses that I always wear here. You know, look, with summer right around the corner, you're going to need some sunglasses. Uh, they look like a rock star, but also protect your eyes from the sun. Why not go prescription sunglasses? If you're in the market for those or any other type of frames, Zenny is the best way to go. You can get up to 80% off regular retail prices. You can get three or four pair for what you'd normally pay for just one. Click on the info button right up here and it'll come out and it'll take you there to get the best deal. Here's Steven with the story. Let's talk about one of the most popular crossover rock tracks of the 80s. Lead single from Out of the Cellar, Round and Round. Climbed all the way up to number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. I believe the payola stopped you guys. That should have been a number one hit. And you're correct. You know, people don't really get it these days about what we had to go through or even the label. I mean, like people don't know you brought radio stations blow and, you know, money and we're selling out arenas. What are you talking about? I mean, every one of my friends had this album. Of course, iconic cover, <laughs> which everybody started copying you guys after that, right? Yeah, that's Robin's girl, Tawny Katane, and Neil Slow's our fame photographer. I had the idea of calling the record Out of the Cellar because I had a song from Mickey Rat called Out of the Cellar, but I never titled an album after a song and neil had this crazy idea looking into the cellar and uh, we got a little creative after that well and she of course in the white snake video that's where most people know her from in bachelor party a man's tradition every woman should know about hey it's dark in here tom hanks later on but she wasn't very well known at that point when she was chosen for the album cover. I got to ask you, did you you guys really throw live rats at Tawny during the photo shoot for the album? For the EP? Yeah, we did. We called the place Rat Rats and, you know, we got like, 
a half a dozen. We only needed five. So I think we picked up one in Slow Sour Studio along the way. But Robin was on one side. I was on the other with the rats. And Slow Sour went, okay, throw them. And we did that a few times until we got a picture we liked. They don't make them like that anymore, man. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, that's what was cool about you guys. You had so many great album covers. And the album cover is a lost art. I mean, thankfully... LPs are coming back, vinyls coming back. Well, on that note, on this 40-year uh, anniversary of Rat and Roll, BMG and Atlantic were releasing a brand new vinyl box set, June 9th. And this is the craziest box set I've ever seen. Got a poster, personal photos, a pass, a pic. Uh, it's got everything in there. Yeah. And it's got a 45, nobody rides for free, color uh, vinyl in there. And, and the labels are different. The labels are the covers of the records on the vinyl, which is kind of cool. You know, there's all kinds of groovy stuff in there. It, it, go to my website, officialstevenpiercy.com, and you can pre-order order it on there it's quite the box set that's what's cool about the time we live in now and you can get all those those cool things that the rock fans always wanted yeah well this is a song that went to number four on the mainstream rock chart as well gold single round around was the song that effectively got you signed to atlantic when doug morris came to one of your early shows and saw the crowd just freaking out to the song when it was essentially brand new to the audience yeah and we had it in our set in early 83 but it wasn't quite there it didn't have that bridge i knew right from the beginning You know, it wasn't until Bo, you know, Atlanta, uh, Doug Morris went, we'll sign you guys. This is going to be your producer. We were like, who gives it? Who produces it? We're making a record. We're signed to Led Zeppelin Rolling Stones label. You kidding me? Where do we go? So Rob and I, you know, we really didn't give it. We had a home. We were getting ready to make a full record. We go into pre-production with this new staff producer, Bo Hill. Well, Bo Hill goes, what do you got? We go, okay, we got this back from where we got that. He said, what is this song? And we go, oh, well, it's something we're still trying to work the bugs out. And he went, that's what we're working on first. And it was round and round. So thank you, Bo. I mean, the track, I know it was a three-man collaboration, but you composed the lyrics. And this is one of those songs that, is there understand that you guys sat around in a circle at Rat Mansion West? Yes, we did. We would bounce tr uh, one cassette deck to another. Like Robin would be playing an idea. Somebody else would play to it. We'd take that tape, put it in that machine, play it with my vocal yaps, and then Warren would record his guitar on the new tape deck. So we just kept kind of bouncing back and forth until we had a cassette with singing, guitars, maybe a bass, and some ideas. So it was written just like that, and it was Warren's baby, pretty much. Warren came up with the majority of the music. Robin came up with some other part of the song musically and the bridge part. Robin was great at bridge lyrics and parts. Yeah, the three of us created that monster, thank God. What I loved about it is written about the, the karma principle. You get what you deserve, what comes around goes around. What comes around goes around, I'll tell you why. I've always wondered, was it based on a, a real-life heartbreak, someone that treated you uh, badly? If you really dig into it, or if I did, it was, uh, I'm pretty much speaking about us, collectively, the band. Out on the streets, it's where we'll meet. You make the night, or it could be an individual meeting somebody, you know. Uh, yeah, you could probably say that, but it wasn't an intentional idea for me to write the lyrics about some heartbreak. I just went with it, you know, and turned around. What comes around goes around, goes around, comes around. You know, then again, Bo comes in, and, and who knows, maybe he threw something in there too. But uh, hey, God bless, you know.
you had to know that you had something special there when you guys were writing it. No, man, because we thought we had so much better songs. It was just pretty much who's got what, the best of what. And early on, everybody kind of, the four of us kind of wrote. You're doing your first record. We're really not paying too much attention to what song gets on there. Just as long as there's 10 songs on there. And we actually didn't care if it went gold or platinum because we really didn't understand that either. We just knew we were going to be on plastic, as Robin would say. So, hey, we were happy to go plastic, you know. It's also a lost art. The love that you guys and your contemporaries have for music. I mean, you were just excited to, to hear yourself on the radio. A hundred percent. Where did that irresistible Warren D. Martini guitar riff come from? You know, you got to ask him because what I get, what I got out of it is Warren was living with Jakey e. Lee, who was a member of Rat before he split Mickey Rat. As I was turning it into Rat in '82. 83. And dig this. This is funny. Jake was writing music for Bark at the Moon. Warren was writing round and round with me and Robin and all these other songs, Morning After, Licks and everything. At the same time with Jake, you know, and <laughs> Jake showing him songs to play in our set as a newbie. And then they're writing some of the best songs for Ozzy and Rat. And Warren, 18 years old. I mean, yeah, right. I always read it. He drove up from San Diego to LA, basically nothing to his name but a guitar and an amp. And I wouldn't let him go home. I had gigs set up and I go, You ain't going home, dude. And he was supposed to go, Well, I'm starting college. We're like, College, you know, you're in the you're in my band now. And he never went home. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I love it. Warren wasn't as confident about the hit potential around around, I read. Yeah and Atlantic wanting to make it the first rat single, but that music video and uh, you guys did something really amazing there as well. You had Milton Berle and tell me how that came together, how you guys decided to bring Milton in and do that. Well, here's how it goes. You know, we're, we're passing around ideas for this video. And then we have this video companies who are giving us ideas, too. And we all put our two cents in, right? Our manager, Marshall Burrell. Marshall's like, well, I'd like to bring in Milton Burrell. Well, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek. You know, everybody's too heavy metal out there. You know, you, you got to be more like, do it more like Van Halen. Fun. Southern California, you know, and we were never into that deep metal hard, you know, we loved the music, but didn't want to emulate it. So we decided, yeah, we can take a joke, met Milty. And when he brought him down, it was pretty much happening right there. Like the butler dancing, my roadie gave him the jacket to put on. There's a crippled rat up on the wire I put on because he had a hurt leg. I mean, it was just happening like that. We went along. Well, the minute Milton walked in the room, you know who Don Lutz is, right? Big Audio Dynamite? Well, he directed uh, that, produced it, one of the two. He was there. The minute Milton walked in the door, he threw up his hands and went, ah, Mr. Television, holy shit. He, Elvis went, he was the first show Elvis was on, you know, Milton Burl show. Elvis Presley. <laughs> Milty just went for it. He's infamous for being in drag, right? And he goes, I'm going to play two parts, not one. Yeah, I'm going to play the girl and I'm going to play the guy. And it just built as we were there. We were creating it, actually. We had kind of a storyboard, but not really. And and we kind of just went along. Warren jumping through, the that was right done right then and there, too. I thought, yeah, how about we have him jump in the, you know, it was it was a trip, man. It all just worked, you know, at that moment. We learned a lot from Milty. Like, we hung out a lot. He took us to the Friars Clubs in Beverly Hills. Oh, man, he was a character, those old comedians. And I love that shit, Johnny Carson. Some people won't get it, but most of us do, you know? We had fun with him. Those Friar Clubs, let me tell you, those the old comedian guys, classic guys, they, they don't hold back. I still talk to Marshall a lot. You know, we're still friends. Round and round, what's cool is it's it's dominated pop culture, especially recently. I mean, featured in Stranger Things, The Spy. Away. We'll 
What's cool about that is I was about the same age as my youngest son, maybe a little bit younger when Out of the Cellar came out. I grew up in a small town in Idaho. It was the potato capital of the world. Just a bunch of potato fields. Potato heads. Yeah, and nothing to do, you know. And radio and MTV was my window to the world. And Rat, I remember, man, I remember buying that cassette and wearing it out on my Walkman. And this was this music spoke to us. And what's cool now is that my kids discover it in Stranger Things about the same age as me. And it's going down to another generation. Isn't that a trip, man? We go to, I mean, I go to my shows because there's no rat touring and there probably won't ever be. I think we were only supposed to be around for a while. So this box set's way cool uh, again. But um, yeah, I got to tell you, if it, 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 uh, if it wasn't for MTV2, there you go again, you know, that meet him. But at my meet and greets, we have so many young, young people like our fans are 40 years old. How old are they when they saw us? 15. So that makes them 40, 60, whatever. We're still rocking and kicking ass, man. For the young people to see so many of them, like uh, at my meet and greets now at my solo shows, and just sing in the top of their lungs round, they're right there. It's like wow, we crossed over. Yeah. And by the way, we just did a we did a Geico commercial not too long ago with round and round, a three part. We do have a rap problem. Yeah, man, the, the youth, they're discovering how cool our music was 40 years ago. Not just mine, you know. Well, the Supernatural was in that. And then I love the placement in the first season of Cobra Kai as well. Oh, that was my mom. I'll uh, call her back later. Hey, was that just... Rat? Awesome, right? What would you think about Cobra Kai? Are you a fan of that show? I've watched it because my um, fiance uh, here, you know, her grand uh, son watches it. Not too recently, we're we're hanging with the family and actually got to see it and hear my song in that part. Going, okay, I get it. Okay, I get it. It's not just like um, here's a phone call to our publishers. Uh, they want to use round and round. How much? You know, it's like no. What is it for? And where is it? Where is it placed? And what's going on? Let's know more about it before we just, you know. And it ends up being in a really cool show. On this whole 80s rock rabbit hole? That shit is dope. Well, and Johnny, uh, the main character from it, I mean, that's the music he loves. And it really is a tip of the hat to the music that, that we grew up with. It, rebel music and and also Guitar Hero, Smash It. Rock Band 2. And then the Geico commercial. I know you already mentioned that. What did you think about that when that was presented to the band? I went for it. I was like, this is nuts. You know, I just wish, I, I was wishing it was the original guys. Uh, that was my only bitch about the whole thing, you know. Benefits aside, D. Martini and Crosby, you know, and myself benefited. But, but I mean, I really wish it was like Warren and Bobby and, you know, pretty much the whole band. Uh, that would have, you know, made the icing on the cake. But, you know, we've gotten our songs in other movies and things from Point Break to Golden Child to Weird Science. So, I mean, we... we we've poked you, you know, all through the 80s. Well, Geico, they only chose songs that people are going to know. I mean, they, they've done a few commercials like that. They had Eddie Money in one. And they're choosing ones that have that that uh, that pull in pop culture that meant something to the generations, multi-generations. I get the business, you know. That's what it is. There is show business in there. Eventually, you learn. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, the commercial is so popular, it recharted round and round. It went into the Billboard Rock Digital Song Sales Chart and I think it was June of 2022. Yeah, it did. It recharted again. And uh, 
You might see it again. I can't say for sure, but inquiry minds want wanted to know, and we were asked again, so we'll see. What do you think about all these decades later playing it and having written such an iconic song? What are your thoughts on all these years later? Um, you know, I used to discuss this with Robin quite a bit. I miss him dearly. It is how we at least got one song that'll outlive everybody, outlive us, and, and just be there forever in music culture, so to say, as you said. And we talk about that every now and then. And it, it, it's very rewarding, you know, because it wasn't all just fun and games as people, the 80s, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you know, is what it was. But um, we really took our, 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 our writing seriously. You know, we wanted, we didn't want to sound like the Motley's. We didn't want to be heavy, heavy metal. We wanted hooks. We wanted girls. We wanted a wide audience. We didn't want just guys. So we had a lot of thought out process and, and that song being one. So the best thing about it is, is, you know, I'm proud to have that, that one song. You, you can't call us a one hit wonder. So when people say that, I go, well, isn't that a, way cool song round and round to have if it was a one hit wonder you know so very happy that we actually you know came up with this song we didn't know we didn't know what we were getting into when we wrote it it was just another song you know hey make sure to leave us a comment about this amazing song about rat Stephen piercy what are your thoughts on the album the band what are your memories tied to them you know if you dig our content we invite you to subscribe so you never miss out on our content to get the box set that steven was talking about just click right below we'll put it in our description and you can check that out till next time three chords <laughs>